Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, a good evening for everybody. Uh, thank you to join us in this session uh, about large language models and the impact on the web. And we plan to anticipate some questions. We are now in the last day of IGF, and we had a lot of sessions regarding generative AI. And this session is a little bit different because we will try to focus on some technical aspects and how uh, generative AI, in general sense, could impact the web ecosystem. So we, when we plan this activity, we designed it, structured in three main topics. One about uh, data mining from web content. And we have a policy question for this. I read this. And so we have three main dimensions and three uh, key policy questions that you guide our discussion here. But of course, we can go further on some aspects. And the first dimension is the web as, uh, as data source for LLMs. And we have the, f the policy questions. The policy questions. Uh, what, what are the limits of scrapping web data to train LLMs? And what measures should be implemented within a governance framework to ensure privacy, prevent copyright infringement, and effectively manage content creator consent? And we prepared these policy questions, I, I think that four months ago. And since then, we see uh, some work on this. For example, OpenAI and also Google, they create uh, a way to block data mining. So it's an it's a approach to give uh, user more control of their content. Uh, we have a second dimension that's what happened if we incorporated uh, generative AI chatbots on search engines. And for this dimension, we have the following policy questions. What are the potential risks and governance complexities associated with incorporated large language models into search engines as chatbot interfaces and how should different regions, and for example, Global South, respond to the impact on web traffic and consequently in digital economy. So if you have like search engines replying directly to the query and not giving access or links to the original content, okay? So, but we have a lot of other technical and ethical questions about this that you can go further. And the third dimension is the web as the platform to post uh, content generated by AI. And for this, we have the following policy questions. What are the technical and governance approach to detect AI-generated content posted on the web, restrain the dissemination of sensitive content, and provide means of accountability? And for this workshop, we have an excellent team of speakers from different backgrounds, from different stakeholder groups, and from different uh, regions. Uh, we will have Professor Emily Bender for, from University of Washington that you join us online. We will have Wagner Santana from IBM Research. We will have Yuki Arazai from Osaka University that is here in person. We will have Rian Budish from Meta that you join us online. We will have Dominique Hassel from W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, that you join us online. And we have Rafael Evangelista from the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee and professor of University of Campinas that is also here. So I will start. Uh, actually, uh, every speaker will have 10 minutes for initial considerations. And we will start with Professor Emily Bender. Professor Emil Bender, thank you for joining us and accept our invitation. The floor is yours.
Thank you so much. Ohayou gozaimasu. Um, I'm joining you from Seattle, where it is the evening. Um, and I have prepared just a few remarks, and I'm hoping I can share my screen for some visual aids partway through. Um, but I'll try that when I get there. Um, to the first question about the limits of scraping web, web data to train LLMs, I think it is really unfortunate that we have come around as a global society to a situation where the default seems to be if somebody can grab the data, it's theirs. That doesn't have to be the policy standpoint, but we have to take action if we want to change it. And what I would like to see it change too is what Sasha Costanza Chalk calls consentful technology, where the data is collected in a meaningful opt in way only with consent of the people contributing the data. And the benefit that will come with that is that such data con collection has to be intentional. Right now, the data underlying LLMs is largely collected very haphazardly. The, the push has been to get the largest possible data set um, because that leads to more fluent output, that leads to output that can seem to speak to more topics. And so it's just been, let's grab everything we can that hasn't left room for documenting it so that we know what's there. And it also hasn't left resources or room for um, really building something that is representative of the world we would like to build. It's also incidentally not representative of the world as it is because the internet, as we'll see with my examples in a moment, doesn't reflect a neutral viewpoint on the world. Um, moving on to the second question. What are the potential risks and governance complexities associated with incorporating LLMs into search engines? These are enormous. And it's really important to understand that a large language model is not an information source. The information that is stored in a large language model is literally just information about the distribution of word forms in text. It's not information about the world. It's not information about people's opinions about the world. It does include reflections of opinions in the form of biases that are expressed via the distribution of word forms in text. Um, thinking about the implications for the Global South in particular, and starting first with that idea of bias, here's where I want to try to share my screen. Let's see if this works. I teach with Zoom all the time, so it should work. Um, just gonna be brave and share the desktop. All right. Do you see a tweet? Hopefully. Um, this is a, a, an author advertising a preprint paper. Um, and what they did in this paper was they looked at the ways in which mentions of people and places um, basically cluster together in very large scale collections of text. They're looking at Lama 2. Um, and this was presented as though it were a world model rather than just correlations that entities in the US tend to be mentioned in the same kinds of, of um, textual circumstances. What is particularly striking actually about this graphic is just how sparse the data is in the global south. And so we are getting lack of representation and then misrepresentation because we are relying on these data sets that heavily weight the, the gaze of the global north, and that's a big problem. The other thing that I wanted to show you has to do with pollution of the information ecosystem. So as we let these synthetic media machines just spill their synthetic text into the web, it doesn't stay contained as the output of ChatGPT, but it moves from location to location. I tested this today, it is unfortunately still true. If you put in the Google search query, no country in Africa starts with K, which isn't even a question, but it's a search query, out comes this false snippet. While there are 54 recognized countries in Africa, none of them begin with the letter K. And then it nonsensically continues, the closest is Kenya, which starts with a K. <laughs> um, and where did this come from? So this is Google search, I'm not even using BARD here, but this is Google search taking a snippet from the first hit for this query, which is this page called Emergent Mind, where some developer has chosen to post the output of ChatGPT. I don't know who this person is, I don't know why they chose to post this thing, but somebody decided to give ChatGPT the input 
did you know that there is no country in Africa that starts with the letter K? ChatGPT is designed to provide outputs that human raters say this is good. In other words, it's designed to output a sequence of text that reads as what you want to hear. And so ChatGPT replies, yes, that's correct. And then continues with that same string that we saw Google pulling up as its snippet for the search result. So there's two big problems here, right? One is we have the output of the synthetic media machine that looks like very fluent English. And so it sort of slides in with other kinds of information. And the other is that our information ecosystem, just like a natural ecosystem really is a, this interdependent collection of sites and the synthetic text doesn't stay quarantined to where it was output. All right, I'll stop the share there so that I can see my notes and you can't. Um, I want to move on to point C here. The question is, what are the technical and governance approaches to detect AI-generated content posted on the web, restrain the dissemination of sensitive content, and provide means of accountability? So technically speaking, with the synthetic text that we have now, this cannot be detected after the fact. It has to be marked at the source, and that means watermarking. That is not impossible. There's really interesting work, uh, for example, published at ICML this year for very clever ideas about how to put in watermarks in synthetic text that would be hard to detect and remove. But honestly, even something that is relatively easy to remove would be an improvement. Because if we have watermarks, then the default use case would contain the watermarks and we could filter the synthetic text. And just like oil spills in the natural ecosystem, synthetic media spills in the information ecosystem are a situation where less pollution is better. Even if we can't get rid of all of it, it's worth designing policies to minimize it. So I really think we need policy action here um, and not just we can't just pin our hopes on some technological solution that would allow us to detect this stuff after the fact. Um, so. I think that is everything I plan to say. I want to make sure there's time for everyone to speak. I look forward to learning from you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Emily Bender, uh, for your considerations. And now I invite Wagner Santana from IBM Research. Wagner, the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Try to share my screen a second. I need to quit and, and join again, just a sec, <laughs> sorry. So uh, we wait in uh, Wagner, join us online. So we move to Professor Yuki. So thank you. <coughs> thank you for um, inviting me to this pa exciting panel. So I, I, my points are quite largely overlap with what Emily just said. But uh, for the first point, first question, the limitations of scraping the web data to train large language models is that we should be aware that web data never represent people in real world. It is highly skewed in many ways due to unbalanced distributions of content creators. For example, now SNS texts occupy a large portion of web data, which come from mostly a specific group, particularly young groups of people using SNS. And also like social biases or even hate speeches can be more significant in the web data than what we really see in the real world. And there are a large amount of automatically generated content, uh, including noisy or even toxic ones in the web data. So web data can never be balanced to equally represent people in the world. And large language models trained on such data inevitably inherit the same fe same feature or same trend or same characteristics of the of such web data. 
so it can it won't be a uh, perfect like like the the like correct or trustworthy um model as it is so we should we should be aware of that and for the second point uh what are the potential risks and governance complications associated with uh incorporating large language modeling into such search engines so I think one of the serious concerns is that chat based search can be too handy for people to use, which may accelerate the tendency to accept a response as correct or trustworthy without looking up different sources of information. So um, as I just said, the web data does not represent real people and they, uh, the web data, it, it sometimes they, there is a lot of long information. So language language model trained on such data has the same trend. So there's no doubt, um, so the such such is now it's our lifeline and its advancement is really appreciated, but we must ensure the way to access various sources of information so that we can check the, the information is trustworthy or you know it's 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 something um we, we should believe. So so for this we we, I think it's a good way to uh, address this problem is that to have a way to link the generative text to the some kind of data sources, so which allows to understand as to what information these texts are based on. So as a group, we, we, are, we have been working on this kind of problem, so natural language processing can help somehow help to identify alignments between generated and generated and text in real world. Such um, kind of provenance information gives us a chance to step back and think, uh, wait, is this like this chatbot um, response is really trustworthy or not? So another concern is that the current large language models cover mostly major languages uh, because they are data hungry and require a large amount of text for training. So text data of such scale is available only for major languages. And besides the evaluation and benchmark uh, data sets that uh, we are heavily rely on to developing such large language models, are also uh, concentrate on major languages. So, yeah, so this trend hinders, uh, may hinder the expansion of the technology to regional or local languages, which may widen the digital divide across the world. So we should explore as a way to train large language models um, in a data efficient way and cover like various languages and cultures and so on. So for the, the third question, what are the techni technical and governance approaches to detect AI generated content? I think, yeah, as, uh, yeah I, I was about to refer to the same paper just Emily mentioned, like, like watermarking for the, the generated text. This is a technical way so that we can track down uh, who generated, or which model generated such text. Um, but as, as Emily said, I, this is just a technical solution and we need a policy or governance to really uh, work, did such kind of technology really work in, in the world. So that's all from my, from myself, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yuki. And now I invite Brian Budish from Meta. Thank you, Ryan, to join us. Thank you very much. I, before I start, did you want to go back? I see Wagner is back on. Uh, did, did we? I know we skipped him, so I just wanted to make sure that. Ah, okay. Uh, Wagner is back, right? No. Yep. So, yeah. I'm here. So yes. can can you try to you you are you going to share your screen, Wagner? Yes, yes. Okay, let so again. let's try. Can you see my screen? Oh, okay. okay. Can. So perfect. Now it's okay. So thanks. I'm sorry for for the previous <laughs> situation. Well, um, I prepared um, a few slides just to try to delve into the questions uh, presented by Diogo, but under the lens of this idea of thinking about the context of creation of technology and the context of use of technology. Um, well, as uh, Diego mentioned, we're thinking about scraping web data, privacy, copyright, and also the use of LLMs 
to search engines, different regions, and how the digital economy may be impacted, and also the whole idea of detecting AI-generated content, dissemination, and accountability. Uh, for the fir first point, um, I, 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 uh, uh, I like to think about all how we came here, right? So first we had a, the web one, then web two, the social uh, uh, web, and then uh, now with the blockchain, with the promise of uh, providing more trust. But if we pause here and think about LLMs, now we're having this data used to train models, and then we have this black box without transparency about the data that is inside. And what how is going to be this uh, web plus, web three plus with data? And the the concerning thing about is how is going to be when it starts to be retrained on the data that is using right? Uh, what are the biases? And this has already uh, uh, been mentioned by other panelists that uh, we have bias. We know that. And how is going this going to be amplified by this uh, the way we have? And we have uh, um, uh, approaches like the robots txt file to block but uh, uh that shouldn't be the default right <laughs> that capture anything and you have to block for someone to not use your contents right so uh, um and we also uh, uh can start thinking about machine learning attacks people can start creating pages just to poison llms that are going to be trained on that those uh uh, uh, uh data sets so th these are some some of the aspects that i wanted to to bring um uh first and moving to the second question, um, well, I, I often see this, this discussion about humans and humans uh, uh, substituted, replaced by humans plus AI, humans plus LLMs, right? Um, and again, back in the web too, we had just content creators creating content, e-commerce platforms, and then the consumption by people, social, and then conversions, and then this coming back to the platform and part to the creators, right? And nowadays, with adding LLMs to this equation, we have this idea of having LLMs with the content creators, creating maybe more content. And then there's this whole promise of uh, increasing productivity. Um, again, we have uh, platforms, but now the consumption is not only by people, we have also robots consuming that to their own uh, uh, interests, right? conversion, and then this will come back in some form and uh, uh, distribute it. But uh, back to this idea of replacement, uh, I'd like to bring a, a discussion around, usually we have um, this, this, this examples of certain categories, and the one that I like to, to uh, explore is about attorneys, for instance. So there's this whole discussion that attorneys are going to be replaced by attorneys that use LLMs. But if we think about the language they are being, that these LLMs are being trained and the laws, um, and usually, so those platforms are paying US dollars, right? I'm, uh, I'm located in New York, uh, TJ Watson uh, lab, but I'm originally from Brazil and uh, uh, the currency impacts a lot in how you use those platforms, right? Um, so this is, is the one aspect I, I wanted to bring. And the thing is, these discussions usually about replacement are closest to the context of creation of technology, right? People that uh, uh, speak the same or the uh, most uh, uh, used e uh, language on those uh, data sets used for training, right? Um, and moving towards the third question, um, uh, and, and um, we already uh, uh, saw some of the, these aspects. I think that one aspect that I wanted to, to emphasize here is the um, idea of the accountability and generated content and the, the understanding of how the technology works, right? It predicts the next word. And if we get this into scale, we have really large content being created, right? Uh, and I, I like to see that and, and discuss about the, that being just a one way. And if we try to get, for instance, uh, a reverse prompt in which we give uh, a content and ask for a prompt, you will not get this. It, it is not trained for that. And it has no uh, means of re, uh, getting the input back. And um, we, there's this whole idea of understanding the limitations. And um, in Responsible AI, there's this discussion around moral entanglement in which we should have technology creators 
of being morally entangled with the data and the technology they create, right? And I would also expand that to the content because nowadays we're seeing people using um, some LLMs in a not better way, not right way. Uh, I brought some examples that I saw in a prompt engineering course of uh, ways that people present on how to use large language models. And here, some quotes on creating blogs and mainstream social media uh, about things that people don't know, right? So I think that there, we should have also this idea of moral entanglement for content that also people create. And uh, the, the thing is that we have this huge technology that is consistent and unpredictable, and it's hard to cover all possible outcomes of context, right? So um, the, this idea of technosolutionism and technocentrism brought us here, right? Um, I brought really just a, an outline of the uh, responsive inclusive framework that we proposed in our team. Uh, the RNI framework, it brings some discussions around context of creation versus context of use and this distance, how this distance can be uh, um, concerning and uh, a notion of stakeholders that goes to self business up to society. And here, uh, uh, the idea of presenting this picture is that And well, um, in the context of use, we have um, creation of technology, prototyping, development, training, and deployment. What we have in context of create uh, context of use, sorry, we have users, uh, tasks, equipment, and social and physical environments, and all the possible variations of those. Right. So we have really complex situations. So it's nearly impossible to predict all possible contexts before uh, and after, even after deployment. Uh, let's think here some examples, people using bi riding bikes while uh, using mobile phones, right? And if uh, for developers, uh, uh, it's hard for us to think about tasks and ways of people using uh, mobile phones while riding bikes. And imagine this last one with six mobile phones uh, and riding a bike. And here we can see that uh, it's the same app. Pokemon Go, uh, but imagine that we are in a context that people are using six different LLMs interacting while riding bikes. It's impossible to predict all of these possibilities. So um, why does distance matter? Because we have, at the higher the distance, the more impersonal technology is. And that's what we see nowadays. Uh, technology is created, created in one region, used in uh, all around the globe, uh, lived experience for people creating technologies are different from the ones impacted by these technologies, right? And this culture of build fast, break and fix, which is often uh, popular, um, it, it influences in this impersonality for, for technology. And there's also imbalance in terms of perspectives considers. And unfortunately, the ones with power to compete, understand and promote changes are very few. So to conclude, uh, Without studying how technology is used, we are hindered for the real impacts. And our premises when creating technology are limited in terms of coverage of possible contexts. And, and we need um, uh, uh, more ways of covering all these possibilities, diverse teams and all the things that we already know. And But there's one interesting aspect is that people repurpose those technologies. Uh, we have been repurposing technology since uh, uh, web one, right? And um, some, people use that in a really good way. So we, we need to empower those users, but also to prevent harmful uh, uh, aspects. And uh, there's this whole idea that innovation uh, may need uh, uh, freedom to experiment, right? But also responsible uh, innovation teaches us that we need um, avoid harms, do good, and implement governance to um, make sure that these two things are happening at the same time, right? Uh, and uh, we see that Usually we have um, uh, regulations responding to changes. And I think that this, this uh, is one interesting way of starting and starting a, a change and, and re responding to the, the things that we are seeing out there. Thank you. Thank you, Wagner, to bring your considerations from the industry perspective. And now I invite Ryan from ADA to also share uh, inputs from the industry. Thank you, Ryan. The floor is yours. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, it's, uh, I'm coming from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, where it is quite late at night. So I'm going to try not to speak too loudly because my kids are sleeping in the room next to me, but uh, let me know if you uh, can't, can't hear me. Uh, so I, I wanna start by taking a step back. And you know, I, I think that uh, that that it's still, even though it doesn't feel like it some days, it's still very much early days for generative AI technologies. And I think what these technologies might look like uh, as they unfold uh, is still a bit fuzzy, but it isn't hard to imagine some of the huge positive impacts that they could have for businesses, large and small, for healthcare, for the delivery of public services, for advancing the UN's sustainable development goals and much more. And, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, maybe they think about, you know, AI chatbots or some of the really fun generative AI tools, like, uh, like some of those that Meta announced uh, just a few weeks ago. But before getting into these questions, I, I just wanted to mention a couple of uses of large language models that we've developed that I think highlight some of the tremendous opportunity here. One area is translation, and we've published groundbreaking research and shared models for translation, such as our no language left behind model and our universal speech translator models. No Language Left Behind, NLLB, is a first of its kind AI research project that open sources models capable of delivering high quality translations directly between nearly 200 languages. Because high quality language translation tools don't exist for hundreds of languages, billions of people can't access digital content or participate fully in online communications uh, and communities on the web in their preferred or native languages. And tools like NLLB can help address some of that. And when comparing the quality of translations to previous AI research, the NLLB 200 models scored an average of 44% higher. And it was even significantly more higher than that for some African and Indian based languages. And we're also developing this universal speech translator where the innovation there is that it can translate from speech in one language to another in real time, which is something that can work even where there is no standard writing system. And that's really important because when you think about how a lot of language translation models work, particularly speech-based ones, they start with speech, translate it to text, translate the text, from one language to another, and then translate that back and you know transform that back into speech, and that that breaks down if you don't have a standard writing system in the middle there. And so something like Universal Speech Translator can help address that. And eliminating language barriers could be a perf could be profound benefit, making it possible for billions of people to access information online across the web in their native or preferred languages. And we've also made other large language models available to researchers uh, and have seen really tremendous uh, research and innovation there, including like our OPT-175B model, which has been used for all kinds of interesting applications like generative protein design to improving content moderation tools uh, online. And so I think that there is really a potential for immense benefits of these large language models uh, on the web. And, but at the same time, there's also undoubtedly risks and problems. And like any technology, an LLM itself is not inherently good or bad, but the critical question is what is it used for? And I think AI technologies and LLMs can drive progress on some of the most pressing challenges that we're facing today. So when we think about governance, we have to strike a balance between mitigating these potential risks, uh, particularly from high risk applications, while ensuring that we can continue to benefit from innovation and economic growth. And, you know, as, as we've heard already a couple of times today, you know, the, in order to build these large language models and to have these benefits uh, that, that, that they're able to potentially bring, 
the volume of material required is to train them is almost incomprehensible in scale. We're talking hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of pieces of information required to train a large language model. And in order to build these groundbreaking uh, tools uh, and have the training data necessary, many companies have to use data from a wide variety of sources, including data publicly available from across the internet. And, you know, it's the, the, the sheer scale of these systems is partly why these issues that, that Diego has teed up, uh, rightly so, uh, is why they're so important and so complex. So on the first question, um, the, the piece that I wanted to dive into, uh, to at least to start with, is about, uh, is about privacy. And, and, and I want to talk about you know, some of the ways that we're trying to develop these technologies in a safe and responsible way with respect to privacy. I think we, have, we know we have a responsibility to protect people's privacy, and we have teams dedicated to this work for everything we build, including our generative AI tools. A few weeks ago, for instance, we announced a bunch of exciting new generative AI products, and privacy was really important for how we develop those features, with a variety of important privacy safeguards to protect people's information and to help them understand how these features work. Our generative AI features go through a rigorous internal privacy review process, for example, which helps us ensure that we're using people's data responsibly while building better experiences for connection and to help people express themselves online. For publicly available information, for example, we filtered the data set to exclude certain websites that commonly share personal information. And uh, importantly, we didn't train these models on people's private posts. And we, uh, for publicly shared posts on things like Instagram and Facebook, they, they were a part of the data used to train generative AI tools. And we train our generative AI models to limit the possibility of private information that one person may share while using a generative AI feature from appearing in responses to other people. Now, on the second question, you know, this is something that we think a lot about how we can build these tools so that they can benefit everyone, including people in the global south. And one important way that we're trying to do this is by making AI technologies more accessible to more people. We've been very public about our views on open source, most recently releasing Llama 2 and Code Llama models. And we do this because we believe that the benefits of AI should be for the whole of society, not just for a handful of companies. And we believe that this approach can actually make AI better for everyone. With thousands of open source contributors working to make an AI system better, we can more quickly find and mitigate potential risks in systems and improve the tuning to prevent erroneous outputs. And the more AI-related risk risks are identified by a broad range of stakeholders, including researchers, academics, policymakers, developers, and other companies, then the more solutions that the AI community, including tech companies, will be able to find for implementing guardrails to make these technologies safer. And an open innovation approach also has economic and competition benefits. I mean, LLMs are extremely expensive to develop and train. And that's why increasingly AI development and major discoveries happen in private companies. But with open source AI, anyone can benefit from the research and development, both within companies, but also across the entire range, across the entire global community of developers and researchers. And this is something we've experienced firsthand in other contexts. Our engineers, for example, developed and open source frameworks that are now industry standards, like React, which is a leading framework for making web and mobile applications, as well as PyTorch, which is now the leading framework for AI. And so now onto the third question. Meta has learned from a range of experiences, both positive and negative, over the last decade. And we're using these lessons to build safeguards into our AI products from the beginning so that people can have safer and ultimately more enjoyable experiences. I think it's important when we talk about watermarking, particularly for something like text, that 
our view is that generative AI doesn't, doesn't help bad actors spread content once it's created. Bad actors can really only spread problematic content, whether AI generated or not, through known tactics like fake accounts or scripted behavior. And this means that we can actually continue to detect malicious attempts to spread or amplify AI generated content using many of the same behavioral signals that we already rely on. And we know that generative AI can help bad actors create problematic content. So we have teams that are constantly working to get better at identifying and stopping the spread of harmful content. And we're actually optimistic about using generative AI tools themselves to help us enforce our policies. And this issue is not unique to Meta. It's a concern across industry. And that's why Meta and many of our industry peers voluntarily joined the White House commitments that include a commitment about watermarking AI content that would otherwise be indistinguishable from reality. But make, make no mistake, this is a deep and significant technical challenge. And currently there really aren't any common standards for identifying and labeling AI generated content across industry. And we think there should be. And so we're working with other companies through forums like the Partnership on AI in the hope of developing them. And so what should governance of this technology look like? And I think that you know we support principled risk-based technology neutral approaches to regulation of AI. We think that measures should not be focused on specific technologies such as generative AI. Instead, our view is that regulation should be focused on the what, the outcomes that regulation wants to achieve or prevent rather than the how. We believe that this approach is more future-proof and helps strike a better balance between enabling innovation while continuing to help us minimize the risks. So with that, I'll stop there. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Now we move uh, to technical community and I invite Dominique from W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium to join us. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you Diogo for the invitation. Uh, just a quick few words about what WCC is and uh, maybe why I'm here. Uh, so WCC is uh, one of the leading standard organizations for web technologies. Um, and in particular in WCC I've been in charge of uh, developing our work on bringing machine learning uh, technologies to, to web browsers, which has uh, led me to uh, look at the broader impact of uh, AI on, uh, on web content. Uh, so to the three questions that uh, were raised for, for this panel, um, the first one around the uh, uh, limits of uh, scraping web data. Um, so I think it's interesting when you look at that question uh, and you look at what exists today, uh, scra scraping web data is something that probably started from the very early days of the web that, that has been a, a critical component of one of the tools we all rely on, uh, which of course are uh, search engines. And so one of the questions I uh, wanted to raise is how do LLMs and search engines uh, differ in terms of uh, scraping web data and why should they be handled differently? Uh, and I think one of the uh, clear answer to that has already been alluded to. Uh, search engines today fulfill a role of intermediation between content creators and content consumers uh, where uh, content creators can expect uh, something back uh, in, the, in the form of a link back to the original content. If you look at an, an LLM, uh, in most cases, and maybe this will change, uh, as others have said, this is a very fast evolving space, but today an, an LLM is mostly a black box. You get an answer, but you don't know uh, the sources from the training of that uh, LLM, and you don't know exactly which sources were used to uh, build such an answer. Uh, and some of it is structural to the technology itself. It's not just uh, a limitation. Part of what an LLM does is uh, compress all this information uh, they gathered across the whole corpus of data they, they collected. So given the fact that copyright itself uh, was, at least from my understanding, always uh, building as a trade-off between incentivizing uh, content creation and uh, making sure the content would get 
widely published and distributed. Uh, I think the fact that LLMs uh, today have, uh, to say the, the least, uh, an unclear story about how they consider the copyright of the content they integrate in their training. Uh, I think to me there is here a really fundamental question, uh, understanding indeed whether it's uh, permissible for LLM to use any kind of available uh, text and data for, for that training or whether as uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Bender said, this needed a lot more explicit consent from the content creators. Uh, and my perspective is that indeed, the current uh, robots exclusion protocol, which is really about excluding crawlers, uh, not uh, saying anything about uh, what the crawling data should be reused for, uh, is not a sufficient mechanism to ensure the explicit consent of uh, content creators. We, we need something uh, a lot more robust and a lot more opt-in rather than opt-out from my perspective. Um, I, I think the question about privacy is also uh, interesting. Again, if you think about the search engine uh, comparison, something that has emerged over the past few years is uh, the so-called right to be forgotten, where at least in some regions, uh, search engines have been mandated to uh, remove content that is of private, that is private of nature. And of course, th th there is also some controversy about uh, the feasibility of this uh, request and uh, overall impact on uh, on uh, the information space. But if you think about that particular question and LLMs, again, uh, is it even feasible today to uh, untrain such a specific part of an LLM that could have been learned over data that would have otherwise been removed from uh, the public information space? Uh, I mean, to me, that, that illustrates some of the really tricky questions, no matter how careful the training might have been, the data might have been curated. Uh, it assumes that this is a static set of uh, permissible data, when in fact, uh, what is permissible has to evolve over time based on evolution of regulations, based on evolution of individual uh, rights and so on. Um, so I, I guess to me, the, the answers to what are the limits, they are to me pretty uh, large. I, I think there needs to be a significant rethink uh, of uh, how uh, training uh, should be done. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of value in having a, a lot of text uh, to create some of the really impressive uh, outputs that LLMs have been able to to, to bring, but, but that cannot be uh, at the expense of making sure that uh, in particular content creators uh, get the incentives to continue to create and publish that content because otherwise at the end of the day, of course, there won't be anything left for, for LLM to build on if content creators stop publishing their, their data uh, no matter what. Um, in terms of the questions around the complexities of incorporating uh, chatbots into search engines, um, some of the main points I think have already been made. I mean, uh, to me, one of the critical point again was made by uh, Professor Bender, uh, mixing something that uh, users have approached as a source of reliable information with uh, 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 checkable uh, provenance, with something that is not meant as a tool of uh, uh, necessarily trustable information or checkable information, uh, is uh, a really challenging uh, UI uh, question. Um, typically, probably not a, a, a good idea, uh, although there could be uh, uh, um, protections around it. Sorry, it's uh, 3 a.m. here, so <laughs> the brain is still a bit waking up. Um, uh, and the fact that these interfaces are really sleek in a way makes the problem even more, more damning. But, but in terms of the complexity of the governance question, I think we are dealing with the questions we've seen uh, emerge uh, again and again. 
uh, what are the uh, limits that uh, can be put into things that are primarily a products and a user interface or even user experience considerations. Uh, I think we all agree that there has been a lot of value in allowing a lot of uh, innovation, a lot of uh, competition in that space. And so th there are limits to, to what uh, governance, external governance ca can uh, impose in that space. We are seeing, seeing some evolutions in that uh, in these limits with some of the uh, regulations, for instance, emerging with the uh, uh, Digital Service Act in the EU. But to me, there, there is something here structural uh, in terms of governance that is uh, who should have a say <laughs> about what gets exposed in a, a search engine interface. Um, and even if uh, some of this may or may not be the, a good idea. Uh, who is going to be at the table to participate to these conversations? I, I don't think it's a, a simple question. Again, the, the, the trade-off between uh, enabling new ideas, new interfaces, new uh, interactions, and making sure we don't uh, weaken some of these tools that have become uh, structural, uh, systematic in their importance, I think is something that we, we are going to be facing uh, for, for for the years to come. Um, but, but again, in terms of one of the impact that I think uh, we need to keep repeating in the importance of the web ecosystem, the fact that today LLMs don't generate uh, backlinks, they generate uh, digested, compressed uh, content is something that uh, further goes against the grain of the role of search engines, uh, not only social role, but also economical role of search engines, which uh, again, typically have operated with a, a notion that they serve as this intermediary between content creators and content consumers. Um, finally, on the third question around uh, uh, approaches to making uh, uh, AI-generated content uh, detectable, um, th there is definitely a challenging uh, technical question. Uh, how do you watermark text in a way that is uh, meaningfully detectable and resist to uh, changes? Uh, and the latter, I think, points maybe to the more structural issue to me in that space is that um, some content that gets uh, released and published is purely AI generated and uh, LLMs allow to provide scale and uh, uh, possibly unfortunately <laughs> some level of trustworthiness in the sense that they provide very sleek outcome. Um, but increasingly, my guess at least is that LLMs will be used not just as pure generators, but as uh, uh, authoring tools, something that help uh, people create content, uh, not just create content that gets released as is. And so when you get into that mode, it's no longer a binary, yes, this was created by AI versus uh, this was created by a human. I expect a lot of content that we will see uh, in the years to come will be uh, hybrid content with AI having either provided a first version, having provided uh, corrections to existing content, or even a more iterative process between uh, human and AI generated content. And how do you mark such a content, uh, even without thinking of what are marking or what kind of metadata could be uh, used to reflect this, I think is, uh, to say the least, challenging. Um, of course, the need to uh, mark at least purely generated AI content, I think, remains uh, important and worthy uh, of addressing in itself. Uh, and I would say it's probably even uh, worth addressing for LLM uh, trainers themselves. Uh, if you're training your LLM on generated content, you're going to create uh, likely a lot of uh, drift in the, the quality of the uh, of the training uh, over time. So there is value in being able to either exclude or at least uh, treat differently such content. 
but at the end of the day, I, I think the real question that this particular trend of uh, AI generated content is uh, bringing even more strongly to the surface is one of indeed accountability and transparency about uh, uh, source of uh, content. Uh, misinformation, uh, fake news haven't waited for LLMs to emerge. Uh, the, the content for spammy, the farms for spammy contents haven't waited for LLMs either. LLMs are very likely going to bring uh, uh, a different scale to the issue. And so that certainly doesn't mean we should not address uh, the problem. But to me, I think it's really important we address the broad issue as uh, the issue about how do we get uh, as a society uh, to managing uh, this uh, uh, different level of quality uh, of content, the notion of who is responsible for content that gets uh, published, and that we take into account uh, the impact that LLM brings to the scale of that issue. But, but I, I doubt that focusing specifically on an LM or on AI generated content is the right framework for, for the discussion. With all that said, I, I think the real critical gap I'm seeing in terms of governance here is uh, one that I think this very panel is trying to address. We need to have a lot more structured conversations between uh, technologists, uh, between research, between uh, regulatory bodies in structuring this space uh, so far it's a lot it's way too much uh, siloed conversations uh, among our own small communities uh, having uh, places having opportunities for um, more than a panel really uh, day-long conversations about how do we uh, uh, with our various stakeholders with our various perspectives on the problem space come to uh, a set of, if not solutions, at least directions, at least places for experimentation that cross uh, these barriers across research, uh, uh, technology, uh, and regulation, I think is really the critical piece because until these uh, silos remain, then the gaps between these uh, conversations are the places where the things we don't want to appear are going to, to stride. Okay, thank you, Dominique, for your contribution. And now I move to Rafael uh, from the Brazil Internet Steering Committee and also a professor at the University of Campinas in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Diogo. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for the invitation and congratulate the organizers for the quality of the questions presented in this panel. Uh, however, I must say I won't be able to address the complexity of all the issues mentioned in the activity description. Um, one pressing concern I would like to address is the proliferation of low quality content on the internet. And the root of this issue, in my opinion, is the financial model that underpins much of the web's content creation. The digital advertising ecosystem, which re rewards content creators based on the number of views or clicks, has inadvertently incentivized the production of sensationalist or even misleading content. This is particularly evident in Brazil, where such content has not only misled the public, but, has also, has, but also has posed significant threats to the democratic process. A case in point is the 2018 elections, during which certain far-right factions adeptly utilized instant messaging groups to disseminate and amplify online content. This content was then monetized either directly through the platforms or indirectly via digital advertising. And something similar happened in the context of the 2016 US elections where the actions of, the ma of Macedonian groups seeking economic gains are well documented. From the perspective of the develop developed nations or the so-called global north, these practices might seem distant or even improbable. However, the reality in the global south, characterized by stark economic disparities and significant 
currency fluctuations paints a different picture. There, many individuals, including young professionals, find themselves resorting to producing subpar or misleading content as a viable means of income. This trend isn't limited to mainstream platforms. Even alternative outlet, media outlets, which traditionally championed unbiased and independent reporting, are succumbing to the allure of increased, click, increased clicks and the sub subsequent revenue. The overall quality of content produced in Portuguese, speaking of the case of Brazil, has dropped considerably due to the perverse economic incentives for, the web, for web publishing. The advent of large language models further complicates this landscape. There's a growing concern that LLMs might exacerbate and spread, of, uh, and spread uh, low quality information. Uh, the spread of low quality information. To counteract, to counteract this, we must reevaluate and overhaul this, the existing compensation structures governing web content production. The current business models, especially those of major platforms, big tech platforms, had, have inadvertently skewed the balance, often to the detriment of genuine, high-quality cultural and informational content. In my capacity as a board member of CGI.br, we have dedicated time and effort to discuss potential leg legislative actions to curb that, uh, that scenario. Our prim primary aim is to find ways to reallocate the enormous wealth accumulated by major technology, technology corporations to fund better quality content. We believe that these resources can be instrumental in promoting and sustaining high quality, diverse and inclusive, inclusive journalism, which, which is cru crucial for a well-informed society. Our team is not just looking for short-term solutions, Instead, we are uh, determined to craft a strategy that can overcome the prevailing marketing in incentives, which, more often than not, tend to favor quantity over quality. A substantial part of our discussions focus on how journalists and content creators can be fairly compensated for their work. Many suggestions on the table are rooted in copyright claims. The core argument here is that many of online platforms are reaping significant profits from journalisti journalistic content without provi providing just compensations to those who produce it, which is similar to what is happening with the LLMs. Interest interestingly, this debate parallels the discussions about the training of artificial intelligence systems, especially when it comes to the use of vast amounts of data often without proper acknowledgement of or compensation. While I personally find these arguments compelling and worth considering, the field of journalism introduces its own set of complexities. One of the most pressing issues is defining the boundaries of what it truly qualifies as journalistic content and what not. The blurred lines between opinion, fact, and entertainment content make um, content make it a daunting task to set universally accepted compensation standards. I believe that this solution isn't merely to bolster existing copyright frameworks. Instead, we should focus on cultivating an environment that encourages the creation of high quality content that benefits the, coll the collective. In the, in the realm of journalism, this could manifest as public funds sourced from tech giants, but managed transparently and democratically, dedicated to promoting quality journalism. Implementing such mechanisms won't be without its challenges, especially when it comes to defining quality journalism and safeguarding it from undue external influences. The challenges posed by LLMs are analogous. Take, for example, Cielo, a digital library that offers open access to scientific journals. Initially a Brazilian initiative, uh, it now boasts participation from 16 countries, predominantly Portuguese and Spanish spe speakers, with over 1,200 uh, 1, open access journals 
uh, is a treasure trove of information readily available to LLMs for training purposes. This represents a significant public investment from the Global South, which is now being harnessed to train technologies predominantly controlled by a selected few corporations, a select few corporations. In my, uh, in my view, the answer is not to restrict access to such invaluable sources, resources, nor is it feasible to compensate every individual author of these scientific papers directly. Many of these authors are already compensated by their academic institutions to produce publicly accessible knowledge. It's essential to recognize that while LLMs might be the brainchild of ma major corporations, the knowledge that fuels them is derived from a collective commons. Thus, our governance solutions should pivot away from individualistic compensation models. Instead, we should champion initiatives that acknowledge the collective essence, essence of knowledge production and channels resources towards bolstering public digital infrastructures, in the sense LLMs publicly uh, use it as uh, public digital infrastructures. Along with these public digital infrastructures, we need to establish uh, governance and financing mechanisms that ensure the fulfillment of public and democratic interests. interests. It seems clear that the technolo technological and financial difference between companies from the global north and the global south creates a situation where only states have a realistic capacity to compete. The web, with its open and collaborative nature, was an infrastructure, infrastructure that excited everyone at the, be at the beginning of the 21st century due to the possibilities of producing free and accessible cultural commons. However, social media platforms soon emerged with their walled gardens, blocking content in interoperability and privately appropriating collective production. AOMs represent a new, chapters, a, a new chapter in this challenge. They appropriate not only the expressed content, but also the ways we express our, ourselves, the form used to express ourselves. While LLMs undoubtedly bring benefits and have many uses, leading to the, the rapid adoptions when used in the context of weekly regulated advertising and surveillance markets, formatted by distorted economic incentives, they become tools for further production of low quality content. Thank you. Thank. <laughs> Thank you, Rafael. Thank you all the speakers for initial remarks. We have different inputs from different stakeholders. And now I uh, open the discussion. So uh, I invite the audience, both in person and online audience to ask questions. And also I invite the speakers to comment on the content discussed here. So we have two questions. Uh, three questions here on si four questions on site. So, four. <laughs> okay. So I I think that we can run the mics. So uh, yeah, it's it's better than go there. I think. Uh, no, I think that we can run this mic here. Yeah, my name is Julius Endert from Deutsche Welle Academy, G uh, German public broadcaster. So I would like to connect what you said. Um, so we are also trying to find out how the effects uh, of especially genera generative AI on the freedom of expression is. Um, so will, will, we, will it be a tool for allowing more people to express them freely or will it maybe on the other hand be the opposite and that we see new limitations, uh, especially in, in unfree media systems and surroundings and authoritarian uh, regimes, so the effect also on the public discourse. That is my question. So what is the effect on the freedom of speech and the public discourse, to make it shorter? Okay, so I think that you can reply now. Yeah. Um, 
as I was trying to say, I don't think that, uh, of course, uh, authoritarian uh, countries represent a, a different challenge, a, a more like a specific context, but I think that uh, what I was trying to express is that uh, AOMs will not only be used uh, in this context, but uh, even in the democratic context, uh, context um, in free countries, we have this uh, bunch of incentives for the production of low quality content, and I think this the MOMs we will use for for that. And uh, the only the, the thing that I think that um, could be useful to to uh, combat that, to try to avoid those those things, is to understand that uh, we have to tax the companies and to use that funds to create uh, public uh, incentives uh, to produce uh, a, a content that is um, of quality and, uh, uh, and regulated or governed by uh, uh, public institutions that can be democratic. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. So we move to the second question. It was over there. So uh, you can go to the mic there, I think. Hello, uh, my name is Tel from University of Brasilia. And um, uh, I, I, have, I, I took a question, I'm starting my question with the point that uh, the representative from Meta just brought up, which is the idea that you don't regulate uh, the form or the process, but you regulate the product, right, the, the outcome. Um, and I'm wondering, we're talking about this in the context of very few businesses, just as platforms and social media are controlled by the same few businesses that control the development of LLMs, and not even states can compete with the development and the pace of LLM development. To, what, what is the role then, what would be realistic roles for the state and for the role of openness in this scenario, considering that also openness is co-opted by the same platforms to develop their models? I, I wonder what your views are on, on the state and the openness models. Okay, so I think for these questions, I invite uh, Ryan to re reply, and then I open to the, all the speakers to comment, okay? Ryan, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, th I mean, thank, thank you for this question. I mean, I think that it's, it's important to, you know, in, in some ways, I would push back a little on the framing of the question, because I think the when you look at the companies that are developing uh, these large language models, they are actually quite different and have uh, rather different business models and incentives. And, you know, and so I can, you know, speak for, for, for Meta and our view. And, you know, as, as I said in my prepared remarks, you know, that, uh, that, that, that we we believe very strongly in in open source and open innovation and that's uh, actually something that we believe uh, not only uh, will help improve the quality of the models and improve the safety of the models but will also help uh, ensure that, that that this isn't just a domain of a handful of tech companies. You know, when you think about how difficult and expensive it is to train train the models, uh, you know, if uh, if the only options that are available, if you're a small small business or a researcher that wants to uh, to use uh, a large language model, and the only options that are out there are proprietary models that you have to pay for then you uh, end up with a situation where there's potentially a race for the bottom where people choose you know, cheap or low quality models, or maybe they, they try to build their own models and, you know, and maybe you know, that there's a lot of challenges there as well. And so one of the things that we think about since is that by open sourcing uh, many models and making them available, that we're actually able to help support uh, a lot of good research and good innovation in businesses by making it possible for uh, for for people to have access to many high quality uh, models. And so 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 for us, I think it's not about 
gating access to these models. It's actually about how do we enable more, more people to take advantage of these models and then to be able to make them better and build on them and innovate. And uh, when researchers find uh, flaws or issues with the models, and then those, those can then be fixed pulled back into the into the models and then those fixes can be shared by everyone who's building on top of those models so uh so so anyway that, those, those are some of my thoughts on the openness piece of it i open to all the speakers if you want to follow up on these questions sorry uh, uh emily bender yeah you can go emily please actually i have a comment on a different topic so i'll wait yeah, I was going to comment on this topic, so if, if I may then. Um, yeah, yeah, so just reacting on uh, what Ryan was sharing about uh, open source as a potential solution in that space. So first, uh, absolutely, the more open source we get on these models, I think the, the better in terms of uh, transparency, accountability, research improvements, and, and distributions, indeed, of the benefits of LLMs. Uh, but, but I think there is a critical aspect of uh, uh, LLMs that makes open source a, a bit of a mixed story. You get open source access to the code uh, that uh, is, or to the models that are generated by the training, but you don't get access, you don't get open source access to the training data, which are clearly where uh, the gist of the value of these models are. So really it's only half open in that sense. And given all the stakes there are in terms of uh, selection, curation uh, of the data, um, the fact that, I mean, for understandable reasons, those training data are not part of the, uh, of the opening makes it, I think, an imperfect answer to, to the question of uh, openness. And, and, there are discussions that I think need to be uh, had about transparency around uh, training data sources and um, and the creation process that uh, has accompanied these sources. But until we are having uh, this conversation, I, I don't think that open sourcing the resulting model is a sufficient uh, answer to this desire of openness. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, Emily, you. Yeah, so on a slightly different topic, um, I want to say that all of these discussions become clearer if we stop using the phrase artificial intelligence or AI because it's not well defined. We should talk in terms of automation and then talk about what's being automated. And as we talk about language models in particular, it is, I think, unhelpful to conflate things like the use of language models as a component in automatic transcription or automatic translation systems and their use to generate synthetic media. Those are different tasks. They do happen to rely on the same trained models, but they're being used very differently. And so from a governance perspective, I think it's important to keep it straight. While I'm talking, I want to call out the fact that the uh, no language left behind model from Meta is a very colonialist project. I believe that languages belong to their communities, and that means communities should have control over what happens to data in their language, they should have control over what kind of technology is built, and if there's profit to be made from building that technology, it should be fed back into those communities, and I think this is an extremely important point for people from the global south. It is not right for multinational corporations in the global north to be profiting off of language technology from global south communities. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Rafael, do you want to comment something? Just to add to the question made by Theo, um, I think that uh, you said that states don't don't uh, have the conditions to compete with those. I think if they are really invested in creating something that uh, can be used by the public, it can be like um, the 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 word open source have have been has been used here. And um, it's really hard to define what it means because it can be like uh, it can use a license that is really free or can use a license that just um, okay. But uh, the point is, my point is, I think that if the states recognize that the web is something uh, that they um, 
should care for and uh, if the, these tools to produce content is something that should be really accessible and controlled by the, the, their states or the communities or the public, they, they can invest and uh, not only train models but have servers and have, because there's a lot of costs and I, I think it's not really, really is not realistic to, to think of Global South companies trying to do that, but the states, they, they or at, at least the, the bigger states of the, the Global South, like we, we can think of the, the BRICS countries, etc. Okay, uh, uh, Wagner? Do you want to comment on this? Then I move uh, to you. Yeah, I have quick comments uh, around uh, the, the idea of technology as being in our good or bad. I think that that starts the discussion around uh, neutrality of technology. And I think that that connects a little bit uh, of the discussion tried to bring on the context of creation and use and how this is different, pe different people, different values, and that, uh, um, uh, uh, that is not true, right? <laughs> it's not neutral. That that uh, 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 at least the the lens that uh, we apply to this discussion, and uh, um, it's interesting how we're discussing about the content of web pages, and if we connect really simply with different contents like a media or a code, we need to express or we have mechanisms for control like creative commons how to use how to reuse how to redistribute and for a large language models this was just uh, uh, take for granted and uh, for uh, gathering data right and when we discuss uh, uh, compared and contrast with uh, search engines uh, we discussed we have a link back we have ways of finding content now it's for generating content and the content creators there, where the uh, we don't have transparency on that, and how the the the, the, the stakeholders related to this very content that's being created uh, are being considered, right? So I uh, just wanted to discuss and and to the idea of languages, I totally uh, agree with Professor uh, Bender. And uh, there's the whole discussion on uh, uh, value alignment. Who is aligning those models, right? If we're talking about different languages, different communities, are they participating on these alignments, right? So um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Wagner. We have uh, one comment here, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Puck. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Awards, and we have started in 2003 uh, to look at and uh, show in which way ICTs are used for creation of quality content. And over the last 20 years, as part of the visits process, the World Summit Awards have created a, a library of about 12,500 examples of high quality or higher quality content um, projects, products, and initiatives, um, and about 1,600 winners on that level. I want to first uh, start and congratulate uh, the organizers of this session because I think this has been one of the most substantial sessions of IGF this year and I want to stress that very much. It has been exceptionally good and I want to also um, make sure that you see that the value you give to the different kind of aspects, having somebody from Meta, having somebody from the World Wide Web Consortium, having different views and also from academia and technology community is really valuable. I want to stress uh, a number of points and then come to a question. Uh, one of the points is I really appreciate uh, uh, Emily uh, Bender's uh, point on uh, looking at the colonialism with technology, especially when we look at the effects the platform intermediaries have had on the internet. And I want to just um, reiterate what I said in some other contexts uh, context here at the IGF. It is that we have actually, with the platform in intermediaries, replaced through the internet and cannibalized the editorial intermediaries. And that is something really very, very key to the question also of the um, uh, large language models, which are creating new intermediary structures. 
and that I think is very important. The other thing is that I thought that Wagner's insistence and uh, bringing up this issue of the studying technology in the context of use and how people repurpose technology in multiple ways, I think that's a very valuable, interesting, let's say, culturalist attitude towards the technology. But then the question is, does he have actually examples of how large language models can actually I mean, do that and how they structure and so on? And I think there's a lot of interesting aspects in this. My main point would, uh, however, be on the issue of the question of we are looking at uh, the web as a public information infrastructure. And uh, that is something you know which is only, let's say, part of the picture which is underlying the governance imperative to the internet. I would think that the governance p imperative and the goals and access, uh, aspects uh, should go towards a public knowledge infrastructure. And that relates very much to the question of how to finance it. And when we come to this model of the journalism, the model of the journalism is actually a model of creation of, let's say, having these two markets uh, of having advertising and subscription. And now we need to go into looking at what are the economics actually of this new public knowledge infrastructure. And one of the criticisms which I have of IGF uh, conversations and sessions is that the economic side is, let's say, very much li or largely ignored. And I want to thank very much uh, uh, here, uh, Raphael, for bringing up this issue of the economics of content creation and how we do this. And I would be happy to engage at other fora on the issue of how to tax this and how to work this. I think Deutsche Welle is a very good example of how <laughs> one can say that there is somebody who is really moving into the multimedia space in a very interesting way, combining a public broadcasting model together with the creation of many different kind of knowledges. But my question would be, in which way can we continue within the IGF this kind of conversation regarding, for instance, creating new economic uh, revenue streams for quality content as part of a governance imperative for the internet? I hope that this has been a very clear question. Thank you very much for giving me the space. Thank you for your comments and your question. And Rafael, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, thank you for your comments, and really insightful. And uh, I think that uh, we have to recognize that the internet doesn't live by itself in a separate realm or something like that. It's like we live in a cap capitalist society, and uh, this just drives the companies, and they they can say they can have uh, ethical uh, worries and uh, guidelines, or uh, but we know that uh, at the end of the, the day, the thing that is most important is to please the shareholders, etc. Uh, and uh, I think we have to look at the 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 internet and the web uh, with the lens of how, what are the economic uh, incentives that are playing uh, for content or for the development of technology, how this drives. Uh, so we have to, I think it's important for, and I, th I think IGF is, can be part of that, uh, to build new institutions or re Reinstitutionalize uh, the um, creation of culture, of uh, um, knowledge, etc. Like um, regain the the belief in institutions that can uh, socially discuss some guidelines for this uh, kind of production and uh, to to put our um, much of our resources on this this kind of uh, institutions. Thank you. Any other speaker want, want to comment on this? Because we are running out of time, so we do not have time for more questions. So 
I would like to thank you all the speakers and the audience to join us today. We are in the beginning of a new era and we are raising new questions and I'm sure next IGF you will be here again discussing maybe the same topics but with more information and of course asking different new questions. So thank you all and the session is closed. Thank you.